<laughs> Today we begin our journey together. We begin worshiping together, celebrating together, crying together, fighting together to change this pillar city that we live in. But through our partnership with each other, through our partnership with all of our churches worldwide and God's church universal, we will together turn this world upside down. Amen. Tracy and I feel very humbled today uh, to be chosen to be with such an incredible group of individuals as yourself. Uh, as I told the Bible Talk leaders in our leaders meeting last Sunday, I'm not coming here to tear apart anything and rebuild or fix. I'm coming to build on something that was well built. Um, Acts 17, 26, I so appreciate Liza sharing that scripture. Tracy and I understand something uh, after being around for 23 years. The first thing is that we don't know anything. But we understand this scripture that God picked the times and places for us to be here. Corey had to say okay because God gave him that authority and thank you for saying okay. But we understand that God set us here for a reason. And first and foremost, the reason isn't to lead you. First and foremost, my reason for being here is so that I can seek God with all my heart and find Him in new ways. And then I can lead you. Personally, look forward to this journey. I think we're going to have a blast. I don't know about you, but... But like Liza, uh, like Adriana, who was restored today, like Carol, and like Michael, yo, Valentine, we're going to find every soul that's worth saving. And that's all of them. Amen. I'm so grateful for the foundation that Corey and Gia built here. Um, it's an incredible foundation laid by an expert bu church builder. And uh, Corey, you're a great man of faith. And you're a father to all. Um, I've talked a lot since every time I come up here about who Corey is to you guys. Uh, but to me, he's one of my overseers in this movement as one of our world sector leaders. Um, he's my partner in the gospel. He's a mentor. But most of all, you've just become my friend. And I appreciate our times together and the connection we will share forever. I love you with all my heart. Let's be turning our Bibles to 1 John chapter 4. I saw no more fitting way to start on what to preach than to honor what has been done. You see our incredible banners here that Rob made for us? And uh, we have our mantra, love God, love people. I'm here to tell you that's not changing, amen? In 1 John 4 and verse 8, the Bible says, Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how he showed his love amongst us. He sacrificed something. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. Now this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Again, one amen on that one? Amen. 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 <laughs> Dear friends, since God so loved us, so we also ought to love one another. No, no one's ever seen God. Or you'd die. But if we love one another, God lives in us. And his love is made complete in us. Yeah, I really let that sink in. God's love being complete if we love one another. Verse 16. He goes on to say, And so we know... 
and rely on the love God has for us. Wow. You know, uh, God is love. And He loves us, check this out, despite us. On your best day, God loves you still, despite you. Not to spite you, I didn't say that, don't misquote me. But despite you. Go to Matthew chapter 22. I believe this is the scripture you created the mantra off of. Matthew 22, verse 37. Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Did you sing today using all your mind too? See, because loving God is to put away everything but Him. Every distraction, every hurt, every thought, and focus every one of those thoughts on Him while you sing. I hope I won't see mouthing of words as we go along, but an extolling of the Lord. We're supposed to love Him with all our mind. And yet He, said, and yet he goes on here, and He says, this is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like itself. Love your neighbor as yourself. You know what's so cool about that? We all love ourselves a lot. <laughs> We love ourselves a lot. Yeah. So we know exactly what we need to do. Yeah. It's not a problem. Yeah. We just want to do it for ourselves is the problem. And we've got to do it for others. Yeah. Now it's interesting. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Yeah. Boy, once you get out of that framework and you're doing your works of service and, and you're giving and all that stuff outside of love, it's just nasty. Yeah. It doesn't even feel right. And many give up because of it. But it only makes sense that his greatest commandments are to love not like you love, not like I love. His greatest commandments are to love like He loves. And His ways are not our ways. And that's the journey, is it not? Yes. I've got a couple of points today. The title of the lesson is simply, Love God, Love People. Part one. We're going to have a few lessons on it. Deepening our love for God and deepening our love for each other. Amen. Psalm 145. Our first point today is love God because of His promises. Of course, this will be a many-part series, and we'll end with the best of how to love God and love each other. But in Psalm 145, this is pretty awesome as well, verse, beginning in verse 9. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all He has made. We could just go home right there. There's your reason to be happy. There's your reason to be grateful. There's your reason to give up everything. Whatever, whatever this Bible says, there's the reason why we do it right there. Because God is good to you, amen? Check this out. This, is, this describes our worship, right? And, of course, I want everybody sitting close to each other as we come in the further services. We want, we're a family. We want to worship close together. All you have made will praise you, O oh Lord. Your saints will extol you. They will tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might. Now that's the way we got to share our faith right there, amen. So that all your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. I hope you're appreciative to be a part of God's kingdom Amen. this morning. If you're visiting, you didn't come to church today. You came to the kingdom of God. You came 
where the souls of men have been made perfect. And you look and I know it's confusing because you see them and they're not perfect. But there's a shroud of blood around them. It's like what we see in the movies with the shapeshifters. Sinful and then Jesus' blood. <laughs> perfect. That's how God sees. That's how we need to see each other. That needs to be a part of the telling of the glory of this kingdom we're a part of. My church is perfect. There is no flaw. There is nothing wrong with it. On its worst day. Why? So that all may, men may know of your mighty acts. That's why. Verse 14. No, no uh, middle of verse 13, I'm sorry. The main crest of this point. The Lord is faithful in how many of His promises? All His promises. And loving toward all He has made. The Lord upholds all those who fall. And lifts up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you. See, that's when you know you're doing well spiritually. You know that horizontal and vertical relationship Corey's been done such a great job teaching you? When all eyes are up vertical to Him... That's when you're doing well spiritually. It's your only hope to do well spiritually. And you give them their food <laughs> at the proper time. You got to love that one. Not when you want it. Right when you need it. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all His ways and loving toward all He has made. The Lord is near to all who call on Him. To all who call on Him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear Him. He hears their cry and saves them. And I hope if you're visiting that today you let God save you. Because you've come to the right place to be saved. Where the truth is preached and people love God and love one another. Amen. One of the main reasons, though, that people fall, or maybe fall away, it's been, it was awesome to see two who, re, who have returned to the Lord. They've been restored to Him and their relationship with Him, and then today they were restored to us. And yet, why did they fall? The same reason we all do. There's none above falling. I believe people fall. Because when they read their Bible, they only notice what they can do or can't do, for the most part. Oh, I, I can't do that? What? I can't do that anymore? What do you mean I gotta do that? What you talking about? And then the promise is just lost. Of course, there's promise of consequences if you disobey. They're all in there. When God says, if you do this, I'll smash you, guess what's going to happen? He's going to smash you. And then Satan's going to make you look horizontally and blame somebody. And yet, there's promises of success, prosperity, peace, satisfaction. Every good thing you can think of, there's a promise for it in the Bible. Yes. And I hope you start looking more for those today. Yes. I find most people in speaking to them cannot even come up with ten promises that they know in the Bible. And yet, let alone ten that they fervently hold on to in their tough times. You know, we, we take everyone that comes into the church in through a, a study series we call the First Principles Studies, right? And you know, I just kind of skim through them really quickly, each of the scriptures in about a half an hour or so. And you know, I found 19 incredible promises. Just in those, how much would your life change today if you just totally held on to those 19 promises right now and didn't forget about them? There's a few that I just highlighted that come to mind. Some in the first principle study, some not. Uh, I'm just going to rattle them off really quick. I'm not going to read through them. Second Peter 1.4. He promises that you can escape the corruption of your desires 
and actually participate in the divine nature. Woo! Yeah, we, we should try that. <laughs> First, first scripture in our study series, Psalm 119, verses 1 and 2. The, to those who obey his word and seek him with all their hearts, he promises complete bliss. Superlatively happy. So if you're not superlatively happy, just not seeking with all your heart. But my car broke down. That's why. No, no, no. When your car broke down, you stop seeking him with all your heart. That's why you're... Then, of course, there's Matthew 6, 33. Those who seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. See, we can come to church with a bad attitude. You know what I'm saying? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about seeking first his kingdom and righteousness. You'll be given food, drink, and clothing. And don't have to worry about it ever. You know, how's that? I don't know. But I know God keeps all his promises. So it's coming. But if you don't do it, then it won't. Isaiah 40, verses 29 to 31. Anybody felt weak lately? I felt weak a lot this week. He promises that he gives power and strength to the weak and powerless. And then he adds to it. He says, if, and now to those who trust me, I'll give a new strength, he says. That would be pretty cool. Find a new strength. Philippians 4.19, real simple. He will supply all your needs. End of story. Done. Why do we worry? Proverbs 1.33. Parents understand this. Uh, parents understand this passage because we know what happens in our home when our kids don't trust us or listen to us. Proverbs 1.33 says, if you listen to him, you will have peace. I'm not at peace right now because you're not listening to God. That's the only reason why. But Jermaine didn't call me back. But you're supposed to listen for God. Those who listen to God, He promises you will have peace. Of course, there's Jeremiah 29, 11 through 14. There's several promises in this one. Think of... What's the last bad thing that happened to you that you didn't really like and you didn't understand? See, Jeremiah 29, 11 says that that plan, you know, God made it happen or let it happen, right? We want to say a person made this happen or that happen or my situation, but God made it happen or let it happen. Every one of God's plans, no matter how they seem to you, are to prosper you, give you hope, and to give you a future. Every single one of them. And, and you think about it. He goes on after that to say, you'll find God. Yeah, some of us feel like we can't find God, like he's not listening, he's not there. He doesn't hear my prayer. But he says, you, you'll find me, you're just not doing it with all your heart. When you do it with all your heart, you will find me. Malachi 3.8. You know, it's a funny thing. One of the biggest things that makes us not trust him and pull back is what happens with our money. And he's got such an incredible promise for it. And he says in Malachi 3, 8 through 12, test me in tithes and offerings. So tithes being what we give every week and offerings being things like what we do in the special missions that's coming up. He says, uh, you rob me in this, then you're under curse. But test me in this and I'll give you so much you can't take all of it. Hmm, which one should I pick? <laughs> curse? More than I can handle. And yet we don't test him. Uh, I've been struggling over the missions, not doing it. I've been struggling coming up with it. And it's the first time, literally, in 23 years, I was looking this week and I go, just in case it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. I pledged to give $3,450. That's way more than, it's just like, wow, okay. How am I going to make it happen? I've given about 700 at this point. And so I came up with, okay, I can't, I got my knees replaced. I got metal plate in my neck. I can't run. I can't, uh, it's just, okay. I can run for about 10 seconds and then I'm done. So I go, okay, I can shoot baskets and I need to shoot more. Um, I haven't made a shot yet in the league. Ugh. Oops. Okay, I'll shoot 1,000 shots. I'll shoot until I make 1,000 free throws in a day. And I'll ask people to sponsor me. 
So I put that out there last night. And then I go, you know, that's probably not going to make $3,450. <laughs> this is probably not. Okay, what else do I got to do? And, and I already knew what I had to do. Because I already knew I only got one thing that is worth that much money. And I go, see, most of you think that my most prized possession is my computer, you know. And it's not. I love my truck. And I just kind of knew what I needed to do. And I go, oh, I got to sell my truck. Uh, I don't have to. Uh, I don't want to. <laughs> I really want to say I need it. I really do. I really need it. But there's buses and trains. And I'm sure if I called any of you, you'd give me a ride. Um, okay. Dang it. I did this before. It's what I did the first year as a disciple. And I go, oh, there it is right there. Go beyond what you've always done before. Okay, I'm going to sell it. So I went online and I, I took a couple pictures of it and I posted it on Facebook last night at um, 11 o'clock. And it was like right at 11 on the dot. It just happened to be that way. And you know what? Doggone it. At 11.58, somebody bought it. $3,500, exactly what I asked for. I made my mission. That's just the God that we have. And I'll miss my truck. <laughs> But I, but I love the promise. I know I'll get 100 times as much anything I give up in this present age. And I'm holding on to that promise right now. Love God because of his promises. Secondly, love people because God loves you. I want to talk for a second. Turn to Luke 6. I want to talk for a second about how to treat our enemies and how to treat our brothers and sisters. Luke chapter 6 and verse 32. I love this passage. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Man, God's ways really aren't our ways, are they? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting repayment in full. Your credit cards. But love your enemies... Do good to them and, oh my gosh, it actually says this, lend to them without expecting repayment. But love your enemies, do good to them, lend to them. Then, oh, I love how God does this. He attaches something to it. He just kind of dangles the carrot out there for us. Then there's a reward for you. What is it? I don't know. But it's God, so it's cool. <laughs> Isn't that so backwards from how we desire to live? Yeah. And yet those desires to live a different way than the Bible says be, are, become evil and drag us away not believing promises. So how do we treat our enemies? Think of your enemies. Pray for them. Do good to your enemies. Even give them money and don't expect to get it back. It's real quiet in here right now. <laughs> if this is how we're to treat our enemies, how about each other? It just, it just tickles me that the Lord attaches a reward to lending money to people that are our enemies and being good to them. Just like, wow. It was interesting this week. I, uh... I got some very bad news on Monday. Having a really rough day, and I, I didn't get to go to bed all night long. Just a night of chaos all night. And um, didn't get to sleep, grabbed my son, took him to school. And I'm on my way home. Uh, I'm on my way home from uh, dropping off at school. And I pull up to a stop sign, and I'm, I'm sitting there, and I'm a little overwhelmed, and I'm praying. You know when you're overwhelmed, and you're trying to pray, and it's not really praying? And, and I'm praying, and I'm just, uh. And my cell phone broke in the middle of the night as well. 
So it's a brand new cell phone. It's awesome. I love it. It's almost as much as my truck, but not quite. <laughs> and it stopped connecting to the mobile network. So I can't make any phone calls. So I had this horrible day and I can't call any people. Hmm. What's God doing with me? So I'm sitting there in the truck and stop sign, I stop. And I got my cell phone and I picked it up off the seat because I'm fidgeting because I'm overwhelmed and I'm hitting it on my chin. I'm like, <clears throat> turn left. Woo! Whoa! It pulled over. Okay, you, know, you know why I pulled you over? Not a clue. Now, I, I was not the best kid when I was growing up. So I got a lot of tickets. I know how to get out of tickets, you know. And uh, I know if I play nice with this guy, he'll just let me off. And uh, he's like, so uh, I, I pulled you over for talking on your cell phone. Uh, I wasn't, <laughs> it's broken, <laughs> I'm not talking on it, man. It's, really, you're gonna give me that story? And I just know right there, okay, if I just go with it, he won't give me a ticket. But I, I have to lie to go with it. Oh, God, what are you doing with me? I go, I, I'm sorry, I just, I wasn't talking on it. I was overwhelmed and I was just hitting it on my chin. I, and I heard myself, I'm hitting it on my chin, that's stupid. I really wasn't talking on it. Okay, you're going to stick with that? I have to. Okay, we're going to go the other route. And I'm like, but my phone's in it. And I know not to get out of the car, but I got out of the car. I'm like, and I'm standing on the other side of my car. I'm like, e, please look at my phone. You see, it's broken. I can't even uh, get back in the car. Uh, okay, okay. <laughs> So I signed it, he gets over, I signed the ticket, and I go, you know, uh, uh, I got the ticket already, right? And he goes, yeah, and I go, do you mind if I say something? He goes, no, I go, I know you deal with a lot of people. I know everybody tries to talk to themselves out of the ticket, and I know if I went along with it, you would just let me off, and I, but you actually were wrong on this one, and I wasn't talking on the phone. Okay, go to court, and see you there. <laughs> You know, boy, people become our enemy in the midst, don't they? Yeah. And my first response, I went and I filed a complaint. And because uh, he totally profiled me with my car and race and all that stuff. And I was like, ah. Uh. So then I got to talking to the officer that was there, that interviewing me. And we talked through the whole thing. I tell him all that happened and all that. And uh, as we get through it, he goes, well, okay, I can understand what you're saying. That you, you know, he was rude and profiled. And I'd like to say we don't profile, but we do. And, uh, and uh, I go, okay, I can hear that. And he says, uh, but, you know, if all that you're saying is true, he says, you know, right on one of his buttons there is this actually a camera. And so they have to videotape you, and they have to videotape what happened and their interaction with you and after. And I was like, oh, so cool. I am saved. Because <laughs> I wasn't doing it. <laughs> and he's like, hmm, I was just testing you to see what you're at. I, I didn't do it, so <laughs> that's awesome. Can I see it? <laughs> He's like, well, I'll go watch. And then he called me and he watched it and he goes, you know what? You're right. You didn't do it. You didn't do it. And uh, he was very rude to you. And the way he handled you is not appropriate. And, uh, and he goes, so, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to have to do a little. And then it hit me. I go, oh, Lord, I'm preaching this lesson on Sunday. Oh, my gosh. And I go, you know, I just drop it. What? Just drop it. I, I, I really shouldn't have done that way. I said, I, you know, you don't say you're a minister when you get pulled over in a car. It's just not good for you. It doesn't go well nowadays. It used to get you out of tickets. It doesn't go, that don't work that way now. And I, and I said, you know, I'm a minister. I should be forgiving right now. And I shouldn't even file this. So go ahead and just put it away. And I said, but you could tell him not to show up day of the court. That'd be great. And I'll let it go. And I'll let it go. And, and, and yet... He saw something different than he was expecting to see. And I, and I don't, you know, hey man, I'm not, I'm a sinner. But we've got to learn to treat our enemies in a way where you may get mad, but you come back to your senses because you want to save people. And today I want to counsel you to love your enemies and treat them properly. Turn over John 13. Let's talk about treating each other, the way we treat each other. John chapter 13. Verses 34 and 35. A new command I give you. 
Love one another. And I think we just stop right there, don't we? We just stop right there and start thinking about the way I love, the way I like to be loved, what I want people to do for me, and no, how many people are not loving me right now. And, and yet, and yet the, the path to having a great life is to really love God enough to read through the passage on how to love people. Because it's not your way, it's not my way. New command, I give you love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. And then the promise comes. By this, all men will know if you are my disciples if you love one another. The only way people are going to join our church is if they see that we're really disciples. And you can be as eloquent as you want in the Bible studies. You can cover every single point. You can hit every cross, hit every I, cross every T. And if you don't love the person that's in the study with you, helping you, you're going to watch the person you're studying with eventually fall away, most likely. Even if they respond to the Word of God, they've got to see our love for each other. It's an interesting fact. People who don't show love never feel loved. And yet the way people know you're a disciple is how you show love to all your brothers and sisters that are sitting around right now. I, I think one of the things that we've been talking about that I want to have change immediately is our times of discipling with each other. Because they're just not happening for many people. And what's happening in them isn't really what God's Word says. And it is in these times of what we call discipling that we really show our love for each other. What you do in those times is going to make what you do in the times of Bible studies powerful. And yet we've got to love each other enough to help each other in these times of discipling. Love each other enough to push through whatever we're seeing, whatever is going on, and yes, even whatever drama is sitting right there, and influence one another to be obedient. That's the call of discipling. It's not just that you got together, had coffee, and read a scripture, or said, bro, that's sin, you should stop that. It's influencing each other to come out of that time more obedient to God. And our influence comes for our, from our love for God that we're talking about here today. Yeah. And our love for each other. Yeah. That's what gives us the power to help each other to change. Right. Think about how Jesus did this. How did Jesus love? He loved through serving. Oh, we love hearing about how he washed everybody's feet. You know, yeah, come on, RD, right there, buddy. <laughs> Come on, take it off. The socks are coming off in between the toes, please. And yet the disciples' response, Peter's like, no, Lord, don't touch my feet. And it, and it wasn't because they stunk. It really wasn't. It was because he revered Jesus. Because of the way he loved them. He loved them through serving. But you know how another way he loved them? Consider this in your relationship with each other. He loved them through giving them a mission in their life. Giving them a purpose in their life that went in accordance with the gifts they had. And, you know, we've really got to begin to be able to see each other's superpowers. I mean, you look around the room, we have some phenomenal people. We really didn't need to bring anybody in. Let's just get down to it. We do, but we really didn't need to. But quite honestly, it did, I, think we, I think it was decided because some of you just weren't loving each other enough and stepping up early enough. It's not that you couldn't. It's that you were waiting. It really wasn't needed, though. But, amen, I'll take Mason and Madeline any day. It's pretty awesome. Janelle and Rico and Janelle, I'll take them any time. That's awesome. And uh, there's some more coming, too, that are going to be awesome. 
And they're not coming to oversee or anything. They're just coming to help us crank. It's going to be incredible. And yet, do you talk about purpose and mission with your fellow brothers and sisters? What you see they're, they're going to be doing? Two years, four years, five years? Do you want them out saving the world or you want them sitting next to you still huddled up together? Really? Jesus loved them through correction and admonishment and, yes, even rebuke. Gosh, I hope you don't start with correction, admonishment, and rebuke when somebody's doing something. I really hope you don't. I hope you start with inspiration. I hope you start with, well, amen, bro, you know, that's not good, but I know you're going to get through this. I know you love God and are going to do what is right. I can't wait to see what things are going to be like when you are living out this passage. Because you are amazing and you're just selling yourself short here. Let's go change the world by obeying this passage. He loved through compassion. Sometimes we don't show compassion. A family member dies, a family member in the hospital. In America, we just lack compassion, period. It's because we're, I mean, even our apps, they're popping up right now while we're all in church with murder this, murder that, this person did that. Robbery, murder, kill. And we just lose our compassion for how. That, there's a purpose for all of that. God uses death to draw us close to himself, to wake us up, and to give us compassion for each other. He loved, Jesus loves through his vision for one another. What's your vision? I mean, look, look, to the, look to the back. We're at the back row today. Right toward the back row on this side over here. Think about that. From nine people to the back row. To two mission teams going out from this church right here. Is that not awesome? Because you've loved God and loved people, now I'm asking you to take it higher and get us out of this building and fill this room. I love it. It's a great building, but let's go to a stadium. You know what I'm saying? Let's go to a stadium. Let's go somewhere big. You can't save the city when you can't fit the city where you're at. Have vision for each other. Think of the person that you, in your mind right now is doing worse than anybody else in the church right now in your mind. What's your vision for them? Or are you just waiting to see them leave? Are you just going to let them go? Or are you going to go grab them and, I mean, okay, you know, you can shake somebody's tea time a little bit. Wake up. Come on, come back. I know you're here, but you're not here. Yeah. Like, you have great things. There's great things for you to do. What are you doing? Like, we got to get, we got to do this thing together. I'm here with you. I have vision for you. I mean, look what vision does. Y'all saw Charlotte come in. And then all of a sudden you saw Chris come in. All hard, tatted up. Don't hug me. And now dude is like smiley, happy, helping lead CR. They're married, their family's back together. That's from loving God and loving people right there. Let me tell you, you didn't do that. God did. But he did it through you, and that's awesome. God knew you. And yes, I'm speaking to you. God knew that you are going to change this world. That's why he picked you to be here right now. Make no mistake about it. You're in, you know, I'm in security, whatever. You, God picked you because you're going to change this world. No matter what you think of yourself, God has vision beyond yourself. 
And today I hope you grab it because that is the best life ever when you know why God chose you, you know what gifts he gave you, and you use them for his glory. And we see great things happen. That's why he chose to give up his son for you. Because you're going to change this city. Don't love people because they love you. Love people because Jesus loves you. Amen. Lastly, Isaiah 55. Isaiah chapter 55. Love God because of his plan for you. I'm going to let you just be selfish for a little bit in this last point. The whole point, you just be selfish. It's all about you. <laughs> Isaiah 55, verse 9. As the heavens are higher than the earth. That's pretty far. That's like... They just had a satellite a, a explorer thing go dead what, 200 million miles away? And it hasn't reached that height yet. That's how different God's vision is for you than yours. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it, without watering the earth and making it blood and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So my word goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Wow. I don't know. About you. That just gives me so much security and comfort. Because I mess my life up all the time. And to think that I can choose God's word and it will just propel me past what I would do with my life into his plan for me that he talks about in Jeremiah 29. Think about it. His plan for you is perfect. Take every negative, terrible thing in your mind that's happening and that's part of the perfect plan. And it's for you. Prosper. Hope. Future. That's your path to get there. What's your purpose? What's your purpose? If you're visiting, especially, you may not know. Today, get with the person that brought you. Find out what God's purpose is. Because he's got one purpose that's the same for everybody, and he's got a special one that's just for you. What's your mission? No matter what, here's, a, here's something that you can know. No matter what, your plan, and you got all these people moving and jiving and doing all this stuff, but guess what? Your plan is not God's plan. You may be kind of on track, but it's still not his plan. That's why it gets rough. Because he's guiding you, and you're like, no, uh, no, and you're trying to get off. It, 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 God, get back in there. And that's why it gets rough, just right there. Because we set our desire on something that's not his plan. He's got to get us back on track. But the more your plan becomes God's plan, oh, life gets real sweet then. Woo, baby, it gets hot. It's awesome. Got fired up. Yes. You know, uh, when God's plan becomes your plan almost, it's because it never really is because you never understand God's thoughts completely. That's the journey. But the closer it gets, the more you have to live for. The closer you get to that plan, the more you have to die for. Because that's how you save the world, is letting your life down for people. When I was little, um, I grew up in this mixed house. And, you know, my mom's sitting right here. It's awesome that she's a disciple. And God worked through her to bring me here. Hi, Corey. I'm a mama's boy, too. I'm the only child, and I'm a mama's boy. I'm not ashamed of it, either. <laughs> and, and yet, my dad was black. An American Indian. Yeah. And I lived in this melting pot house where it all came together. 
my mom's family were like, they started in Wales, went down to Germany, hooked up with them, moved from Germany into Nebraska and Missouri, and yeah, they were there. And they're your classic Nebraska and Missouri type of people. If you ever looked at my family history on Facebook, you're like, you are not related to those people. Yes, I am. They're my family. And, and then some of them went on up north of Seattle and Hell's, Hell's Angels, bikers, drugs, all that stuff. And then somehow my dad's family, they're like, my dad's family's like, my grandma's side is slaves. And my grandpas are the Wampanoag Indians from Thanksgiving, mixed with other black slaves. And that's, that's how the family came together. And they had the first Thanksgiving, stabbed all the white people in the back, and then, yeah, that's them. Okay. And they fight over all the land still and everything. And, and they're awesome, but they, some of them migrated out and up to Seattle by my other family. And uh, I got the Hells Angels bikers, and I've got the uh, Jeffersons in downtown Seattle. <laughs> and they'd all end up at my house not liking each other. And they'd be like, yeah, those white guys, and oh, those black guys. And I just stood up on a table one day, and I thought, you are all ignorant. Because <laughs> a thousand years, you're all going to look like me. <laughs> That's the way it's going to end. So you're all ignorant, so you better get used to it. And you think about what God's plans are for you. I remember my Uncle Pepper told my mom that day, um, that boy's going to stand in front of thousands of people, and they're going to listen. And yet, God's plan's always better. God knew that in 2013 and 2014, we'd be in D.C., and I'd stand at the nation's capital in front of tens of thousands of people. And many listened. And you just go, wow. It's like surreal. Like, that was me. You see, that's weird. I'm just a man. I'm nobody. I wanted to be a pro basketball player too, like Corey, and I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to be a fighter pilot. That's the two things I wanted to do. I wanted to play professional basketball, and then I wanted to go be a fighter pilot in the, uh, in the Air Force. And my eyes were too bad, so I didn't do either. <laughs> Amen. Some people get everything they ask for. Some people don't. I ended up being a drag car racer instead. You know, that's the closest thing to going fast I could do. And yet, when I was a drag car racer and came closest to my dream, I was most unhappy. I'm just having a blast now. Just, it's awesome being a disciple of Jesus. I want you to consider what God's plan is for every disciple. A few things. There's much more to it than this, but God's plan is for you. So if you're visiting, I'm assuming you're going to read God's word and jump on in the tribe here. God's plan for every disciple is to be a royal priesthood. See, only priests can intercede with the Lord. And yet God's plan is for you is that you can intercede for yourself and for those who are lost and bring them on in and get them to be able to do it for themselves as well. for you to be fully committed. Yeah, not so much clapping. Amen. In the Old Testament, they were committed because that's the only way their sins could be forgiven. For you, you're, they're already forgiven. It's to be committed because you're grateful that your sins are forgiven. So your desire is to please Him and not out of come here out of duty. If you come here out of duty, then we accept you still. Uh, then you'll get one of those correction admonishment or one of the, hey, there's great vision for you now. But His plan was also that He set it up where you needed to share your faith with other people so you could understand how awesome what you have is. And, and then His plan for you is that you're willing to give up everything you have. See, that had to hit me last night. Oh, dang it, man. Okay, everything. Here it goes. Woo! Bank account's empty and I don't have a truck. Like I'm not going to be taken care of. Like I have not been taken care of for 23 years. Every year doing the same thing. What impacted me when I came around is that people in the 80s did these special missions things that we do? Yeah. Uh, we're just going to blow this thing out, guys. Yeah. We're just going to blow it out. Why? Because it's why you're here. 
It, we just, we do for others what was done for us. I watched women take their huge wedding rings that they got, take them off and sell them for missions. I watched brothers take, I sold a car. I sold an old, used 10 year old car almost. These, these sold their home and gave the whole thing so that I could be a disciple of Jesus. And I'm going to honor that. Every year till the day I die, I will honor that that brother did that so that I could be here and gave up his home for me. Sell so your possessions, property, whatever. His plan was that you would help each other be obedient discipling like we talked about. His plan is that you would give every single day, give encouragement to another disciple of Jesus. His plan is also, check this out, you'll like this, to never complain. And to only let what comes out of your mouth be wholesome so that everybody and anybody that hears it will be encouraged by what you say and built up. And then his plan was that you have a special role that only you can do in his kingdom. And that you find that role and that you do that with all of your heart. Today, as we embark upon this wonderful journey together, as God's family, the Lord is calling us. Love him because of his promises. Love him because he loved you. Love each other because Jesus loved you. But love him because of the incredible plan that you can't even fathom yet that you get to have unveiled as you go year by year. Today, let's live up to this mantra. Let's love God and let's love people.